Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. At Chesterfield in Caribou County in Idaho, a hairy humanoid terrified a party of skaters on a pond. The humanoid appeared, wielding a club, and terrified the party of people. Four toed tracks, 22 inches long by 7 inches wide, were found afterward, and the humanoid was 8 feet tall. The ruckus happened on a frozen river near the John Gooch Ranch. On to the next one. In Boundary County in Idaho, I, Stephen Rees of Paradise, California Now, was spending the summer in Spirit Lake with Steve Shaw at his father and stepmother's house, Mr. and Mrs. Ruth Shaw. Steve and myself were bucking bales of hay at the Harold Glab Farm some 10 to 15 miles away. We were in Dale's Red Ford Pickup and were coming back to Spirit Lake on a narrow, dusty road. It was not far from the Glab Farm, and the road had a thick growth of lodgepole pine on either side of the road. This is where the hair on the back of my neck started tingling, which prompted me, sitting in the middle, to turn around and look behind me. What I saw was a quite tall, long-haired, bipedal mammal with hair from head to toe, complete four steps to get across the road. As soon as we passed the place, it came out onto the road, and it made it across before the distance and dust hid it from view. I kept this a secret for all these years because I was trying to protect it from the harm that was widespread back then. It never looked at us and had complete disregard as to our passing. I never mentioned it to either Steve or Dale, so I don't know if either one of them saw it in their mirrors. I was separated from them some days later as I was put on a bus with some of my other Californian friends and Steve's brother Bruce had taken up a collection of money for gas to make a trip from the San Francisco Bay Area to Spirit Lake to beat a letter Steve's mom had mailed to tell Mr. Shaw to keep Steve in Idaho. The day was clear with three to four miles per hour breeze as it was hot in the field but the stream water through the farm was cold enough to keep our beers cold, and the boss didn't mind. On to the next one. In Clearwater River, near Golden in Idaho County, in Idaho, Mr. C. E. Rickett and Fred J. Richardson eventually saw a cinnamon-colored Bigfoot that had been visiting their camp unseen, which had left tooth marks on a bag and a tin, and had taken a bag of flour. On to the next one. In St. Charles Canyon, in Bear Lake County, in Idaho, a dark humanoid form was observed standing in the woods just outside the campground clearing. Four of us were camping in sleeping bags, no tents, in a clearing recently cut by the Forest Service to develop a campground. No one else was in the area. It was in the early morning hours, perhaps 3 a.m., my best friend and I have been talking about the strange atmosphere of the place, and our wives were asleep. I was just dozing off when I suddenly felt myself jarred awake by a powerful feeling of a nearby presence watching us. I sat bolt upright and looked directly at a large humanoid form standing at the edge of the woods, about a hundred feet away. He or it was totally black, and I could see no features, but the form was perfectly clear. At this point, my friend sat and looked in the same direction. Do you see what I see? I asked him. I sure do, he replied. We continued staring at it, and it at us for several minutes. Then I somehow got the message that it wasn't going to bother us if we didn't bother it. I told my friend we should just lie down and go to sleep. He agreed, and this may be the strangest part. We both fell asleep instantly. At that time, I'd never heard of Bigfoot. 
I don't know what this being was, and I still don't. It could have been a Bigfoot. There are a lot of limestone caverns in the area, and it was still very wild then. We didn't smell anything or hear any unusual sound, although it has multiple fully developed campgrounds and paved roads. Back then, it was very wild and very little visited. Even in the daylight, there was something primitive and haunted about the place quite different in feeling from other camps in the area. My wife and I and a friend and his wife were in sleeping bags, not tents. The women were asleep, but my friend and I had been talking and were just dozing off when I felt a strong sensation of being watched. It was the early morning, perhaps 3 a.m. At this time, St. Charles Canyon was just beginning to be developed by Forest Service. The campground had been roughed out at the top of several miles, of a narrow dirt road leading to nearby Minnetonka Cavern. Pine and aspen forest covered the steeply angled sides of the narrow canyon. No one else was in the campground or the area for miles. On to the next one. In Clearwater County in Idaho, about 20 miles north of Orofino, in a sawmill, the night watchman and several others saw at least three different types of humanoid footprints in the sawdust. They were from very large to childlike. The watchman, Mr. Moore, also heard the creatures jabbering and throwing timber about. One time, Mr. Moore saw a black-haired, six-foot-tall creature with large red eyes and very large breasts. The nipple area Hands and face were not covered by hair, and the skin was pink. The creature also had an unpleasant smell. Also, an enormous dog was seen running with the hairy humanoids in the area. On to the next one. The area has now gone commercial and has much development on it. The actual location is now a tennis court. This was on the old East Lake Road in Valley County. We had gone out along the east side of Payette Lake to park on a double date. One stopped, the other couple sat on the outside of the car on the trunk. I and my date were on the inside and the windows were rolled up. After only 20 minutes, my buddy tapped lightly on the window and once cracked open, said something big had walked completely around the car and was now positioned about 10 or 20 feet in front of the car. He suggests we be prepared to leave in a hurry, in case it was an angry bear. We made ready to turn on the headlights. At that moment, the light came on. We saw in front of us, not much more than 15 feet away, at the edge of a small clearing, a Bigfoot, about 6 feet tall, with dense black fur, and completely standing upright with its arms to its side. This view lasted for only a second, or at the most, two seconds. The Bigfoot spun rapidly on its heels and dashed into the cover of the woods. There were four witnesses in total. It was 10 p.m. with clear skies and a temperature about 65. In the mountains, a clear starry night allows enough light to make out outlines of trees and roads. The area was pine and Douglas fir, forested, and about 200 feet east of Payette Lake. On to the next one. In Bonner County in Idaho, the High Drive is located in a remote park of Selkirk Mountain near Lake Pend Oreille in Montana. My grandfather was a logging contractor and would frequently take me along on sail scouting expeditions. This particular day, we were driving in an area known by the locals as the High Drive. It is a very rugged and mountainous area above Lake Pondere. Most of the road is cut into the side of the mountain, so it is very steep on the uphill as well as the downhill side. It was fairly late in the afternoon and was about an hour before dusk. The road is just an old Forest Service road, and not very well maintained, so we were going fairly slow, maybe 20 to 25 miles per hour. My grandfather made an expletive that I won't repeat and stopped the truck. 
In front of us, across the road, ran a huge hairy animal. It ran down the uphill side of the road, crossed in front of us, and ran right downhill. This took all of about two or three seconds that I saw it, although my grandfather, always on the lookout for game, must have seen it sooner. I remember that it was dark-colored and hairy, with long arms that swung sort of in an exaggerated way. At the time, it looked twenty feet tall. I was only seven, but in reality was probably seven or eight feet tall, and it didn't take it long to cross the road and down the side of the mountain. It maybe took two or three strides to accomplish that, and it was fast. My grandfather grabbed his rifle and jumped out to see if he could see it going down the hill, but he didn't. I can tell you that I was plenty scared. It definitely was not a bear or anything we had ever seen before. I have not told very many people about this, as I thought they would laugh or think we were nuts. There was the sound of brush breaking as it ran downhill. It was about 4 p.m. It was a nice autumn day, sunny and cool. It was pine and fir forest with some swampy areas near creeks that have cedar. It was a very high mountain area. There were steep embankments on either side of the road. On to the next one. Paige and I had set off for a day hike following a section of the Adirondack Trail in upstate New York. We were both wearing light jackets for the day, knowing that the temps were to be in the 50s and that we would be walking very briskly. That was lapse number one. Secondly, neither of us were carrying a compass, with both of us assuming that the trail we took in would be easy enough to follow back out, which, as it turns out, was lapse number two. Thirdly, we had brought a reasonable amount of water for the day, as well as a limited amount of food, the two of us planning to have a hearty meal together come dinner time. That was lapse number three. Between the two of us, we had a combined nine years of education. Despite our education on this hike, we were incapable of making between us one solid decision in regard to safety and our own well-being. As a warning to all of those out there who care to heed a warning, even though we began our day by following what is purported to be a major hiking trail in the region, only hours into the day's hike, we had already made several bad decisions as to which trail was the real trail we were hiking. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, a strong wind had kicked up, and within about 40 minutes' time, what was a sunny sky spotted with puffy white cloud had turned dense and gray, completely obscuring the sun. Soon after, we had lost our bearings entirely, and we were lost. For the next seven hours, for all I know, we were hiking in circles. The realization came upon us that the temperature had dropped about 10 degrees, and with the wind now howling, we were going to have to spend the night alone in the forest, or so we thought. With no flashlight in our possession, we did our best to rip down some pine boughs and create a windbreak to hide behind for the night. At 9 p.m., it was jet black in the trees, and I was never so afraid in all my life with the night's activities just about to begin. We had about half a gallon of water left between the two of us, a small package of cheese and crackers, and a health bar of some sort. At around 11 o'clock, a scream rang out in the woods, which sounded like a cross between a witch and a woman being murdered. It was the most bone-chilling, blood-curdling thing that either of us had ever heard in our lives and it sounded relatively close. As our eyes adjusted to the thick darkness which surrounded us, it felt as though the wind over our heads was gusting to some 50 miles per hour at times, causing the trees both overhead as well as around us to rock and sway, which created a barrage of sounds in the woods. There were creaks and cracks occurring everywhere and anywhere as the two of us were hunkered against a tree trying to stay warm. It was at 11.45 when I heard a loud, uh. It sounded like it was very close to us, and Paige screamed in fear. As we both tried to focus our eyes in the direction of the noise, 
which was by no means a tree noise. Rather, it was deep and guttural, sounding like that of a caveman. Paige said to me, Oh my God, there's something moving in the woods over there. And I immediately saw what she had seen. There was a massive silhouette of a figure darker than that of the woods it was standing in, and it was only perhaps 50 feet or less from where we were sitting. Paige and I looked at each other in the eye in the dark, and when we looked back at whatever we had seen, it was gone. A short while later, we began to hear what sounded like gibberish coming from out in the woods. It started very quietly, sounding like two intelligible people having a conversation, and then it escalated. There were two or more voices. One seemed to be shouting as the other or others were replying back in quicker, subtler tones. Whatever was being communicated was not English, albeit it did sound like a language, not animal speak. It was now about 12.30, and some stars were visible in the sky as the dense cloud cover seemed to be breaking up. We waited for almost an hour until we were sure of east from west, and we decided to start moving toward the southwest, which was how we had begun the day. I know there are many who are already saying what a stupid thing to do, but we were cold and frightened, and we could actually see a little enough so that we wouldn't run into a tree or walk off a cliff, and so we began to move. Arm in arm, the two of us hiked for hours, with our hands outstretched to block any unseen branches from our faces. For the first two hours of our walking, the gibberish persisted to our right-hand side, but never did it get any closer, as far as our hearing it concerned. Whatever these things were, they were flanking us as we walked in the darkness. At about 4.45 a.m., the sky began to glow behind us and the slice of moon was overhead. A sense of calm, and actual joy came over us, followed by the realization that the sounds had stopped as well. We continued to walk until 7 a.m., having consumed half of our remaining water, when we spied out a highway below our position and made our way towards it. It took us 45 minutes until we were standing on the road, not knowing what road it was or where we were, but we weren't in the woods anymore, and that's all that counted. We sat on the side of the highway, until a man came by and we waved him down. He was on his way to work, and when we told him about our ordeal, he told us to get in and actually drove us to where our car was parked. And it was all over. We know we saw and heard Bigfoot that night. The dimension of the figure we saw standing in the trees was unbelievable. It looked like a sheet of plywood standing on two legs, being both tall and wide, had there not been so much noise from the wind and trees, I am confident we would have heard them moving, but it was impossible under the conditions we found ourselves in. It seemed they were following us or escorting us out of the woods, a fact which we will never know, but had they wanted to attack us, they could have and they didn't. On to the next one. I guess my eyes have been fooling me because I have evidently been watching a Sasquatch without knowing it. I will soon be going into the U.S. Marine Corps and my enlistment date was delayed a month, so I could go directly to the school my recruiter had promised me. For the last few weeks, I've gone around visiting friends and relatives for one last time before I take the final plunge. I've been a guest at my uncle's house for three days now, Uncle Don injured his foot last month, so I've been kind of helping him and Aunt Rosie around their place. They have a large piece of land near Pickaboo, Idaho, and it isn't used much anymore, except for raising a small herd of sheep and a few ducks and chickens. But they love it, and I could see why. It's beautiful. Don and I have spent a lot of time on the large back porch as it overlooks a small spring-fed lake back behind the sheep corral. The porch reminds me of a western ranch house with its rustic log walls and matching half-log deck. It has high side rails, also a network of smaller vertical flats that allow one to look out. But if you're 50 feet away from the deck, you can't see anyone sitting there. That brings me to why I'm reporting my experience to you now. For several days, Uncle Don and I have been watching a bear, so we thought. 
as it came out of the woods and walked through the field of tall grass and berry bushes as it made its way down to the fish in the pond. Dawn said the pond was connected to a wider series of larger ponds, and together they led to a beautiful lake where there were summer cabins around it. The fish made it all the way up to my uncle's pond, and for nine months out of the year, there were a lot of sizable trout. Uncle John said jokingly that on his private lake, there is no bag limit. Anyway, with Uncle Don's bum foot and my lack of interest in fishing, the neighboring bear was having the place all to himself. This particular day, Don was chopping at the bit for some exercise, and he was healed enough to walk slowly with the assistance of two canes, so we carefully made our way down the back way. It was a fairly easy path, except for a series of rocks and flat stepping stones between short wooden steps between them. The grass alongside the path was over four feet high. Coupled that with the impenetrable series of raspberry bushes, I couldn't see anything. Even the house had disappeared, except for the occasional glimpse of the tall light pole by the garage. I let Uncle Don set the pace, and with periodic rest, we emerged suddenly on a flat, bare shelf that overlooked the entire valley. All of a sudden, Don's hand was pushing me back as he himself ducked down, whispering, there's our bear. I had forgotten all about the possibility of meeting up with a mean-tempered bear, and my heart was pounding in my throat as I crept forward again on hands and knees. Then, as I could just barely see the bear, it reached out a long hairy paw and plopped a large fish out of the water, but instead of scooping it out like I've seen bears do, it actually threw it over on a grassy spot alongside what looked to be several more fish. Uncle Don looked over at me with a wrinkled brow and whispered, that's not a bear. Before I could ask him what it was, the huge animal must have caught our scent because it stood up on its hind legs and gave out a loud snort. Then it took off back up the hill on all fours, and that when I could see it was no bear. It looked exactly like a bear when it raced up the hill, and its speed was incredible. As the Sasquatch reached the tall pines on top of the hill, it stood to its full height and just stared at us, and then casually disappeared down the other side of the hill. Uncle Don and I walked slowly back toward the house, and it was then that he admitted to the fact that he and Aunt Rose had been aware of the existence of these Bigfoot, and on many occasions, a family of them have helped themselves to a lamb or duck, but nothing excessive. And this only happened when we have a late spring or an early winter storm that interferes with their food supply. Then I asked Don if he knew that I was actually watching a Sasquatch, and he said he expected as much because the bears never come that close. He apologized for misleading me, but if I started talking Sasquatch instead of bear, the whole country would be descending on its property, ruining the privacy for both them and their secret neighbors. Their secret is safe with me, as I think if I start talking about Sasquatch, my Marine Corps career may be jeopardized. Maybe I can someday discuss this experience openly, like when I make general. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!